Okay, let's get started. So today we are carrying on with these simple population models and continuous time. And we're going to be talking about something called uh, Ali effects today. Has anyone heard of Ali effects before? No. Okay. Not to be confused with allele, which is, I don't know if I've got this elsewhere in the notes, allele is uh, a variant uh, at a genetic corpus. Okay. So sometimes people confuse Ali and allele when they're doing mathematical biology. One is about genetics, that's allele. This Ali effect with a capital A. Um, is about population dynamics. Okay. So by the end of today, you should understand what an early effect is. Um, ideas about something called compensation, um, critical and non-critical depensation. So these are just terms we use to describe something related to our net per, per capita growth rates and how to draw baseline diagrams and what a baseline diagram is. Okay. So what is an early effect? What it essentially describes a biological phenomena where when a population gets to a, a relatively low size or density, the per capita population growth uh, reduces, okay? So if we think about, mm, yeah, maybe I'll skip ahead and then come back to that question here. In our logistic growth model, our per capita growth rate decreases as the population size and increases. So what does that look like? That looks like something like this. So as our population size increases, draw it's a straight line because it is a straight line, it looks like this. So that means that as we increase the population size, the capita growth rate is decreasing. This is known as something called compensation. We're going to be talking about Lie effects. Rather than this always be decreasing, we'll have a function that looks, say, something like this. Where at low population densities, it increases. So that means that it's lower at these lower population densities. So just to take a little step back here, the question then is, why might populations exhibit early effects? So what, what's going on here? We're saying when a population is relatively low in size or whether it's uh, when it's a low density, the population grows at a lower rate. Mm -hmm. So can we think of any biological reasons as to why it might grow at a lower rate when the population is small or when the density of the is in a given area is low? Make limitation is a great example of that. Yeah. So if the density of the population is low, then you might not be able to find any mates. So you're not going to be able to reproduce. Um, any other ideas? Write that one down. Any other ideas of things that might reduce population growth rates when populations are small, other than limited mating opportunities. Yeah. Yep, so that's kind of limited to mate limitation, but it's it's again, yeah, so things like seed dispersal is a good example. Especially if it's something like uh, wind pollination, right? So if it has to be uh, well, the seed dispersal slash pollination here. If something is pollinated by wind, then if there's fewer plants per area, then it's less likely that the pollen's going to land on it, right? Um, what other examples can we have? What about, uh, say, species that live in groups. So often lots of prey species, they might live in, in social groups. Think of like herds of buffalo or something. If those groups get smaller and smaller, then if a predator attacks, the herding effect is less effective, right? They're more likely to be predated. So sort of group size effects, let's say related to predation. And that works in the other direction as well. You know, if you've got a pack of lions or wolves, and their population size decreases, the pack will probably become less effective. So there are lots of different biological reasons as to why um, when you reach uh, lower population densities, the growth rate might be lower, okay? So we talked here about this logistic growth model. We're gonna be thinking about a change in this net per capita growth rate so that looks something a bit more like this green one. Yeah. So the, Curve in red, I'll just remove that green line there. 
so we don't have any confusion. This type of uh, decreasing function here is called compensation. That's just a, you might see it written in textbooks as compensation, so that's why it's that. I'm not going to be testing you on, on is this compensation or decompensation. I always refer to them as being early effects, but you might see it in a textbook and wonder what it's called. Why it's uh, called that. So, more generally, what do we need for compensation? We need our derivative to be negative, the derivative of our net per capita growth rate. So, remember, we're writing our dn dt is some little f of n, which is our net growth rate. We can write this as n times by capital F of n, where capital F of n is our net per capita growth rate. So when we have this compensation like this, f of n is always decreasing, then we have no early effects, okay? So the growth rate here is highest when the population is smallest, okay? So what about depensation then, this other term? So the opposite of compensation is depensation. Again, I'm not gonna quiz you on what depensation means. I'll always talk about early effects. So now we have a slightly different scenario that when our population size is small, n increase, uh, f of n increases. Okay, so what does that look like? This is just going to be like that green sketch I had before. Let's make something like this. This can be a little bit confusing sometimes because we're saying in our verbal description that for small population sizes or as the population size gets smaller our net per capita rate decreases but when we draw it it's increasing right but that's just because we're going in we're talking about going in the opposite direction so if i say as the population size gets smaller i'm saying going in this direction as i go in this direction this curve is decreasing okay. so at small populations decreases at large populations, it also, sorry, at small populations, this increases, at large populations, this decreases. So this is kind of like the logistic equation when we've got large enough populations. It's only when we're at small populations that it's different. So this is something also called non-critical depensation, this particular example I've got here. What I mean by that, well, here I've got this positive growth rate. We've got F prime of N. for small n, but it always remains positive. Okay, so if this is zero down here, I always have a positive growth rate. This is non-critical depensation, and this is something called a weak early effect. So as the population gets smaller, it's still growing, it's just growing at a slower rate. Okay. Any questions so far? No? So the third type of uh, relationship we can have between our population size and our net per capita growth rate, I do not know why the screen has just gone up. Bear with me two seconds. There we go. Okay. The third type of relationship we can have between our population size and our mm -hmm. net per capita growth rate is something called critical depensation. So how does this differ? It looks kind of similar to what we had before. One more time. There we go. N versus F of N. This time it say looks something like this. The key difference here is that when n is relatively small, not only do we have the we have a positive gradient, so f prime of n is greater than zero for some sufficiently small values of n, but we also have that f of n is negative when we're sufficiently small. So all we've done from this graph above is we've just shifted it down. Okay, so this one was always positive for sufficiently small values of n. 
And this one, we've just shifted it down. So there's a mathematical definition up at the top. We need F prime of N to be positive for small N. So it's increasing and it's decreasing for sufficiently large values of N. But we also need that it to be negative for small N, not the derivative being negative but the actual function itself, the net per capita growth rate being negative. So a question to you guys then is, what are the consequences of this then? If this net per capita growth rate is small, or those negative, sorry, for small n, what does that mean for populations that are small? We're gonna to get to the example, yeah. So if small populations have a negative growth rate, then they're going to be decreasing. But so if I color this in, this graph here is saying in this yellow shaded region here for population size sizes to the left of this or within this yellow region here, the population is going to be decreasing. And whenever the population is over here, it's going to be increasing. So there's going to be some threshold, right? Where the population, when it falls below that threshold, it's going to start decreasing but when it's above that critical threshold it's going to be increasing that's why this idea of critical definition comes from because there is a critical threshold for where the population switches from being negative growth rate to positive growth rate okay so the consequences of non-critical uh compared to critical definition is that small populations decrease The critical definition. This is usually referred to as a strong allele effect, whereas the previous one was a weak allele effect. So just to make sure that's clear, when we have a weak allele effect, the, the growth rate is always positive. It's just lower than it would be in our classical logistic model where there's no allele effect. So it just grows slowly. So say it's have, you have reduced mating opportunities but on average, you're still producing enough offspring that the population is growing. Whereas in this scenario here, you're producing, supposedly the population density is sufficiently low, you're producing fewer offspring than uh, replacing yourself. So the population is decreasing. Okay. Let's think, go through an example. So suppose we're gonna extend this logistic growth model that we've been working with a lot to include an extra factor. And this represents the change in our per capita growth rate as n varies across an elite threshold. We're going to call this elite threshold. I'll give by this parameter u. I'm going to say it's going to be between minus the carrying capacity and positive carrying capacity. So what does it look like? So we're going to have the NDT is going to equal Rn times by 1 minus n over k, where R is our intrinsic growth rate and k is our carrying capacity. So this is just our logistic model that we had before. And what else are we going to have? We have n over k minus u over k. I hope I've got that around the right way. Yes. So we have this additional term here on this right hand side where u is now a parameter referred to as our elite threshold. So Question then is when do we get a strong allele effect in this model? Let's think about this. This is our net growth rate. Our net per capita growth rate is just going to be this divided by n. So it's going to be r times by 1 minus n over k times by n over k minus u over k. So for a strong allele effect, strong allele effect, what do we need? We need f prime of n to be positive, the small n. And we need f of n to be negative, also for small n. So let's think about what happens. 
at zero. So when there's no individuals in the population, because this is a continuous function, we can think about what happens at zero because we can think about then what happens at, when we've got a very tiny population that's just a little bit bigger than zero. So if we know what's happening at zero, we're going to know what's going to happen at a, a tiny population a little bit bigger than zero. So what's this going to look like? We're going to have R times one minus zero times by zero minus U over K. So is this positive or negative? I heard it depends on you. Exactly, yeah. Depends on you here. So the R is positive. This one minus zero is positive. And this here, this bracket with a minus U over K is going to be positive. It's negative. It's going to be negative. If U is positive. So that tells us that U greater than zero is required very strong lead effect. Let me first copy that down for a second. Any questions so far? Any questions about how I managed to work out that this or the conditions for a strongly effect in this case? To recap what I did here, I had my equation above for the population growth. Is this one here? Yeah. This is my population growth. I can write down what my net growth rate is, little f of n. From that, I can work out my net per capita growth rate, which is just f of little f of n divided by n. So I just drop this n here out the front. I need for a strongly effect the grade of this to be positive. I haven't actually checked that the gradient is positive for small n. I'll leave that as an exercise for you. You need to take the derivative of this and check what happens when n is equal to zero. But I have checked this part here. So substituting in a small value of n, I could just substitute in a very small value of n here, say epsilon, which is much less than one, but it's positive. I could have substituted this in here instead and then worked it out. I would have got the same general answer, okay? Here I just substituted in zero because we know that this function is continuous and so that what is going on at zero is gonna be very similar to what happens at a population size that's just a little bit above zero. One thing sometimes people ask about is, <laughs> what do we mean by small n? <laughs> Okay. Kind of a bit like how long is a piece of string, you know, like a small population size, small relative to what? What this is saying is that there's a sufficiently small population size. Okay. So I'm not saying that what that is, it's just saying that as we get closer to zero, there is some population size for which this thing in green is true. So when we say for some small n, it just means that there is some value of n for which this is true. We might have a scenario, let's find a little bit of space here. We could in theory have a scenario that looks something like this. This is my n versus my f of n. We could have a scenario that's something like this. Terrible, terrible drawing maybe. I'll zoom in even more. Is this a a strongly effect? Yes, because there is some small value of n for which the population growth is negative and which the net per capita growth rate is increasing. It doesn't matter that for you know most values of n it's positive, there is some small value of n for which this is true. Therefore, it is a strongly effect. That this is this is where we go, I guess, between the realms of a mathematical definition of an early effect of being like what's mathematically relevant to a biologically relevant scenario. There can be many populations where, I mean, in principle, in any sexually reproducing population, there'll be an early effect, at least when there's just one individual left, right? In principle, that there will always be an early effect. 
but in practice, um, you know, we will talk about things that are more biologically relevant. So thinking of scenarios, say, like about overfishing or some human interventions that will cause populations to crash. So there'll be some sizable value of n for which the population goes down, not just there's one individual left and then it crashes. Okay, that's a kind of trivial example. Okay, so that's the kind of algebraic way of looking at things. There's also a geometric way of looking at things using something called a phase line diagram. So a phase line diagram, just like when we did sort of cobwebs, we, we can use a geometric approach to, to try to understand or have a bit more intuition as to what's going on rather than just looking at things algebraically. Um, and when we're in one dimension, a phase line diagram tells us about how the population uh, is growing as we vary our um, population size. Okay, so we can plot our net growth function, little f of n versus n, and then we want to see when is this positive and when is it negative. When it's positive, the population grows, negative, the population shrinks. So all we need to do then is plot our little f of n versus n. In fact, we can also do phase line diagrams where we plot the net per capita growth rate. That sometimes makes things more simple. Sometimes it makes things a little bit more complicated because you have to take into account that there was an N in there as well. So what does this look like? Can anyone tell me what this function here that I've just highlighted in pink? Can anyone tell me the power of N that we have here? So is it linear? Is it quadratic? Is it cubic? Is it quartic? Cubic, yeah. So we've got an n here, we've got a minus n here, and we've got an n here. So it's cubic. It's cubic, and it's also, what else can we tell from this? Well, as n tends towards infinity, this is going to tend towards minus infinity. So it tells me a couple of things here. I also know that it's going to pass through zero because we added an N um, on the outside. Okay, so that's going to give me a growth function that looks something like this. I'm going to pass through zero. It's cubic, so I know that I turn, I come up, and then I'm going to come back down again. I know it comes back down again because it's a cubic with a minus sign in front of it. Okay, so this is my little f of n. So that tells me then that when I'm in this region here, this yellow shaded region here, the population is going to be growing because we have f of n positive. If that's positive, then dnbt is positive, so the population is going to be growing. But if we're in this region here, or this region here, these pink regions, then f of n is going to be negative. And so the population is going to be decreasing. So with that in mind, can anyone tell me what these green dots I'm adding on now represent? Yeah. Yep, steady states or equilibria. Okay. So these are equilibria of the model. And why is that the case? Someone else? Why are these equilibria? Exactly. We have f of n is equal to zero. It's positive above the line, negative below the line. Okay, so these are our equilibria. I'm just going to remove these arrows so it's a little bit less messy. Okay, so does that help us solve what's going on in this model? Well, imagine that we're stood somewhere along this line. I'll zoom in a little bit. 
So imagine I'm stood here. This is my population size and zero. Okay. In fact, I should write it as zero. So that's my population size at time zero. Now imagine I'm moving left or right along this line. Which direction am I going to move to a little bit later in time? Am I going to move left or am I going to move right? You're going to move right. Exactly. Yeah. So imagine a little bit later in time, we've moved a little bit along here. So this I'm going to call n at time epsilon for some small n. Okay. Then we can keep repeating that process, right? The same applies here. The population growth is positive still. So you keep moving along. It's continuous. So we're not jumping really. This is just to illustrate what's going on. We can draw on a little arrow here to indicate that when we're in this yellow region, any population size we have, we're going to be moving to the right. Okay. Let's now think about this right hand region over here. Suppose this is now my n zero. Am I going to be moving to the left or to the right? The left. Exactly. So again, a little bit of time later, and at Cylon, we'd have shifted a little bit to the left. And you can click on that same logic, we'll be moving to the left. So in this case, we can draw on arrows here, pointing to the left. How about this region over here? So this is my N0. Am I going to be moving to the left or to the right? Someone else who's not answered. Left? Yeah, exactly. Same logic again. Our growth rate F of N is negative, so we're going to be moving to the left. So how do those arrows help us? Well, we can just think about moving along this line. That's our population size, remember, N. We can think about whether that curve is above the axis, below the axis, is telling us whether we're going to move left or right. And then when we end up at one of these green dots, we know that our F of N is equal to zero, it's in equilibrium. So we're not moving left or right at all. So in this case here, if we we're in this region, we would move this way. If we we're in this region here, we would move to the left. And then when we get to this green dot, we stay there. So can anyone tell me what the stability of this point is here? Is it stable or unstable? Exactly. So if we move a little bit away, we'll come back to it so it's stable. Same logic here. If we have a very small population close to zero, we're moving to the left. So this here is also stable. How about the one in the middle? Unstable, yeah? So this one's unstable because if we move a tiny bit to the left or the right, we're gonna be moving away from it. Notice as well that whenever we have, sorry, question, yeah? We're checking the stability of the zero one. Mm -hmm. Do we have to check that for negative values and it's gonna approach zero as well? It's a very good question. We, I, we do not is the, is the short answer here because of the context that we can't have negative patient sizes. So as long as from the right, it's pushing. Yes. So this is one of those cases where there's like mathematically, we should check that it is going that way. And yes, it is. Um, mm -hmm. Biologically, we only care about positive values of n. So you could set up a, 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 a differential equation model where it could have negative values, right? And then you would care. Suppose this was something about say position along uh, position in space and there was a reference point and so you can have negative values so indicating going west and positive values indicating going east you would then care about whether this is attracting from both sides in this case here we have negative population sizes and therefore we're constraining the, the scope of this model down to what is biologically realistic but a very good question thank you so I talked more uh, in one of my earlier lectures when I introduced this idea of stability about thinking about hills and valleys, if you remember. So another way of looking at these is that uh, when we take the derivative, we're going to have uh, a valley here. And over here, we're going to have a hill. And over here again, we're going to have a valley. These are just hovering above those uh, 
these green dots just to illustrate the idea of if you are a little bit away from this equilibrium in the valley, you'll move back towards it. Whereas if you're over here, you would move towards it. If you're a little bit to the left or right of this hill, you'll move away from it. And again, in this valley here, you'll move towards it. So note that these curves I've drawn here are not the same shape as the red curve. This is just illustrating this idea of balls in valleys or on hills that move towards an equilibrium point, in which case they're stable or they move away from it. This is essentially just about the direction of these arrows. Any questions about the baseline diagram? No? Okay. I thought today I would allow time in the class for you guys to work through the self-study problem, and then you can ask me questions about this whilst you're working through it, okay? So here is a biological example. There's a particular type of butterfly called Carna blue butterfly. Uh, it's a rare and endangered species in North America, and it has a specific host plant that it needs to survive, a wild lupine plant. So it needs this plant uh, in order to lay its eggs and for its caterpillars to feed on it as well. And so as the population of this butterfly declines, the availability of suitable patches that have this plant that can host it uh, become limited. Okay, So one mathematical model for this population looks quite similar to what we had above. We've got a logistic element, and then we've got something going on on this right-hand side here, which is going to give us an allele effect. Okay. And we're assuming that this parameter A, capital A, is positive, and it's capturing essentially this effect of uh, the availability of this plant, the wild lupine patches. So capturing the effects of that on the population growth of our butterfly. And then this epsilon here is a very small number, but positive. And that affects the population growth when n is small, or it has a stronger effect when n is small. Okay, so what do I want you to do? I want you to have a go at sketching a phase line diagram, just like the one I've just drawn now, to analyze the population dynamics of this butterfly. So draw a phase line diagram. And then from that phase line diagram, answer these two questions. Does the population exhibit an early effect? And will the population go extinct when it's rare or will it survive? Okay. Anyone not know what they need to do? No. Yeah. Not sure on what to do. So the first part, the phase line diagram, I want you to sketch a diagram like this, where this red curve is my f of n. So it'll be this function here. I forgot to sketch that. Remember, when we're, whenever we're sketching functions, we want to think about when is it crossing the axes. So when what happens when say n is zero, or values of n where this function is equal to zero, that will tell me when I'm crossing the axes. You can also think about what happens to f of n as n gets very large, it turns towards infinity, and I'll tell you what direction. So that's how I knew here that on the right hand side, I was tending down this direction, tending down towards very negative values. Okay. Have a go at that. I'll walk around and, and answer individual questions if you have them. Okay. Okay, it's about five minutes left, so I'll start going through. Okay, so the first part, let's think about this growth rate here. So we're told, I'm just rewriting out the question here. So we have our growth rate, our net growth rate is a little f of n, which I can write as our population size n times by our net per capita growth rate, capital F of n. What else do we note from here? We note that this function can only ever be zero, this little f of n, when n is zero or n is k. Why is that the case? Well, for this function to be equal to zero, either this rn has to be equal to zero, or the one minus n over k has to be zero, or the n plus epsilon over a has to be zero. But the, we're told in the question that a is positive and epsilon is positive, and the n can't be negative. Therefore, the term on the right-hand side 
can never be equal to zero. It's always going to be positive. So the only two things that can be ne uh, can be equal to zero are the Rn or the one minus n over k terms. So that tells us that we only have two equilibria, n is zero or n is k, which means that our net growth function on little f of n only crosses the axis twice, the horizontal axis, that is. Okay, so we're up here uh, on this example on the right-hand side. So I've switched my version of the notes. Here, when I drew this, this graph before, I knew that it crossed the axis three times. But now we're going to have a case where it only crosses the axis, yeah, the horizontal axis twice. So what else can we tell? So if we think about our capital F of n, our net per capita growth rate, what happens when n is small? Again, this is continuous. So we can think about just substituting in a value of zero into here. And that's going to tell us what happens when we have a very small population. So substituting zero into our capital F of n, the middle bracket is going to go to one. The bracket on the right hand side is going to be epsilon over a. So we have r epsilon over a. These parameters are all positive, as we're told in the question. So our net per capita growth rate when n is small is positive. We can also tell from this, if we were to take our derivative, I haven't got that here, but if we were to take our f prime of n, and then, in fact, if we take our f prime and look at f prime of zero, we could also show that this is positive as well. Okay. So what does our function look like? Well, we have a cubic, but I haven't actually drawn up on the rest of the cubic. If I were to draw on the rest of the cubic, it would look something like this, okay? So this cubic does, of course, cross, cross the axes uh, three times. The cubic doesn't always have to. In fact, I've drawn, sorry, this is not a cubic. I'll take a step back. I've actually drawn here my net per capita growth rate, I realize rather than my per capita growth rate, okay? So because I had an N out the front here, my capital F of N is actually a quadratic rather than a cubic, okay? So this is why it looks slightly differently. This example here is to illustrate that I could solve this question using the, by plotting a phase di line diagram of my per uh, net growth rate, my little F of N, or my net per capita growth rate, my capital F of N. So if you did it the other way around, that is also fine. So just to demonstrate that you can do it both ways. This way is slightly more complicated because now we don't have our equilibria necessary when we're crossing the axes because we have to also account for the fact that there's an n is zero at the front as well. But we see here that our net per capita growth rate is increasing when n is small, but remains positive. We know it remains positive because we have this r epsilon over a is positive. Okay. So if I then think about what happens in the direction I'm moving, when this net per capita growth rate is positive, so that's in this region here, we're going to move to the right, just as we had on our previous baseline diagram. And when it's negative, we're going to be moving to the left. So this is f prime of n is positive. And this over here is f prime of n negative. That tells me that when n is equal to k, it has to be stable. The question doesn't actually ask that, but it's going to be stable. We also know that n is zero is going to be unstable because we're moving away from it. So the question asked, question two asks, does the butterfly population exhibit an Lie effect? The answer is yes, because it satisfies the conditions that for small enough population sizes, small enough n, uh, f prime of n is increasing. That's the key thing about an Lie effect. And then is it a strong or a weak Lie effect? Any ideas? Is this a strong Lie effect or a weak Lie effect? A weak Lie effect. Why is it a weak Lie effect? Because it's real small and it's still going to be greater than zero. Exactly. So even if we had, if imagine we had a population size really close to zero, this is, we're still in this F prime of N being greater than zero region, okay? So even very, very small populations, they will still grow. They will just grow slower than a population that is a bit larger, or rather the per capita growth rate is slower for those populations, okay? 
So we have a weekly effect, a small n. So what does that mean in terms of the final question here? Will the population go extinct when rare? No, why not? Because it will always tend towards curing capacity. Exactly. So because just like I just said here, when the population size is very small, it's still growing. It's just growing at a slower rate. Stellation is driven extinct because this is a weak early effect. We only get extinctions when there are strong early effect. Okay, that's time for today. So I will see you guys on Friday.